give me great pleasure to introduce to you our keynote speaker for today, uh, Yamini Ayer. Yamini is the President and Chief Executive of the Center for Policy Research. In 2008, she founded the Accountability Initiative at CPR. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Yamini Ayer. I thought I'd very quickly, uh, you know, try and weave my own experiences with some of what I see as the big challenges and the big questions in nurturing human capital in our fields. The first big question that uh, the, the human capital in our field faces is this question of whether one has to develop, regardless of whether one wants to be an academic or a practitioner, whether one wants to develop skills of academic expertise that allow you, give you a lens into the world, or should one develop those skills through the actual practice uh, or, or, or of development? And I don't think there's an either or answer to this. It very much depends on one's own individual interests and proclivities, but it is an important question because I think it shapes pathways over the course of one's career. And when I did my master's degree in development studies, I, I uh, audited quite a few of the development management classes. And I actually discovered that what was happening in the development management class was that it was borrowing sets of tools that it um, had uh, uh, that the classic MBAs were using and trying to place them in the context of development but I did that degree I did my development studies degree having spent two or three years doing grassroots field work and I found in fact the templates that were being given were very one size fit all and frankly quite unhelpful and over the years, as my journey in accountability initiative evolved, this, I think, has been one of the most critical challenges that we have faced. Building institutions in the field of social impact is, I believe, very fundamentally different to building institutions in the private sector. The kinds of human capital challenges that you face, and it's not a challenge of talent, it's a challenge of context, and it's a challenge of the kinds of goals that you're working towards, are significantly different. And therefore, those standard templates that may work when the goal is profit, when the organizational structure is designed in a particular way, simply don't make sense in our field. And I've often found it very frustrating when we've been engaging with questions of how do you create organizational structures and systems, how do you go from being a one-person-led institution to an institution of scale, where the institution also moves away from the individual to uh, the goals and objectives of the institution. The kinds of advice that were given were always advice that is drawn from private sector and really didn't fit in to the context in which we were working. But expansion in the accountability initiative, when we wanted to go from three people sitting in Delhi to 10 people in districts all over the country, meant that you had to look at a much wider set of people across regions, but also even more importantly, across very different work cultures. Uh, many of us, uh, uh, for you know, you, in, in elite circles like this, we talk a lot about what does it take to create equal opportunity workspaces, how do you create gender narrative that, um, uh, that, that are equitable uh, and so on. But, uh, but when you start going to uh, the wider net network of colleagues that you want to bring in as organizations go to scale, the entire work culture is very different because you're probably dealing with men and women, and especially, in fact, women who are for the first time coming into a formal workspace. And the notion of a workspace is also very different. So how do you create work cultures that are equitable across? And to be entirely honest, very often the answer is you can't and you'll just have to live with that. But it takes a lot for us as social impact uh, uh, actors, as people who come into this field with a certain vision of the world, to make these very pragmatic choices. I mean, I think the toughest choice I had to make was when I went on maternity leave along with another field colleague who went on maternity leave. And I felt when I came back to work that I ought to be able to give her exactly the same kind of opportunities and flexibility that I, I expected from my workplace. And one of the big struggles was how do we travel when we have small children? I mean, even if you have all the support in the world, I at least found it very difficult to leave my children for long stretches of time. And our field colleagues were hired specifically for travel, right? So I had to reinvent myself sitting in Delhi and find other ways of contributing, and my workspace allowed for that. But um, you know, the question was, how do you create the same environment for, for my other colleagues? And it turned out that it's not so easy. I mean, I, you know, I had the skill to be able to write a few papers, whereas uh, my, uh, my other colleague didn't necessarily have that skill. And so we ended up for, for almost a year or two just you know, hanging out, 
I mean, she was literally on our rolls without having much to do because all the work we were giving her, she wasn't being able to fulfill. She was frustrated and feeling quite, and it really undermined her professional uh, identity because all her other, her colleagues and companions were out doing stuff, talking about the work, and she wasn't being able to do it. And so, you know, somewhere along the line, we had to make a very hard choice. Unfortunately, the privilege I had of reinventing myself and remaining flexible is not necessarily a privilege in this particular context that I could necessarily offer her. And then we had to think very differently about how to ensure that we can retain women and create opportunities for women when they have small children. It required a very different kind of thinking, and there was no standardized template to offer. And frankly, many of the, we, we went and spoke to many colleagues who are working in NGOs, many feminist NGOs as well, and we didn't find the right answer to one of the, to, to, to a challenge as critical as this. Very often in conversations about what it takes to create impact, what it takes to create the right kind of monitoring and evaluation framework, and so on and so forth, this question of whether we should have coaches for leaders in the nonprofit sector keeps coming up. Uh, and you know, at one level, I argue that, frankly, you know, between all the things that we have to do now to have to forcefully speak to a coach is like one extra headache, and I'll do it if you give me a lot of dollars, but I won't do it otherwise. And I certainly won't take it seriously. But having said that, there is a value to having some kind of advisory structure within your board or within, or, or maybe actually probably better not to be your board, just a separate advisory structure that is available on a regular basis to talk with, to share ideas, and to sharpen visions. Because it's when the leadership's vision is really sharp and strong, and, it, and when leadership is able to communicate that to the institution, only then does talent get nurtured, harnessed, and unleashed. Thank you. Thank you.